I'll be honest, I have zero experience on Blender. So sorry, everyone who left Blender related questions for years. Uh, so today content is definitely for you guys. Luckily, I could invite a perfect director slash writer who has tremendous amount of experience on using Blender in production, not only for animation, but also VFX works in live action shorts. Welcome to Skim on West channel, Colin Levy. Thank you. I'm uh, very glad to, glad to be here. And uh, yeah, I've, it's been awesome to see this channel grow over the past, what, like 10 years. Thanks for being here uh, for an interview today. You started as an indie filmmaker and your first shoot was in Root. Uh, is that correct pronunciation? En route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did a whole bunch of shorts before that, but let's, oh, not, really? let's forget let's forget that those exist. Okay, okay. <laughs> More like a well-known short is a uh, en route and mm -hmm. came out in 2010. And right after that, you started to work with the uh, the Blender Studio for their official short called Sintel. So how old were you at the time when the Sintel came out? I believe I turned 22 on the project, so I think I was 21. Uh, when I got the opportunity to to fly to Amsterdam and uh, and work at this animation studio over there and, and mm -hmm. make Sintel together, so I was def I was I was the youngest one on the team and was really just thrown into uh, the deep end. What I I have done in twenty two years old. <laughs> uh, and and after that you joined the Pixar and we were office mate for a couple of years in a very nice window side office uh, with a full of light. Those were the days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we will have a separate time to talk about your career as a filmmaker next time. So let's focus on uh, your primary filmmaking tool, which is a Blender today. Great. After you worked at the Pixar uh, for about five years, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. And you left the Pixar to pursue your sci-fi passion project called Skywatch. <laughs> and this project itself has a lot of dramas in it. Uh, <laughs> but one more time, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> and then you directed another Blender official short called Agent 327. Yep. What's the meaning of the 327? Agent 327 is the short is based on a comic book mm. property over there, a Dutch comic called Agent 327, uh, written and, and illustrated by Martin Ludwig. And that itself is a bit of a spoof of James Bond and 007. But you, you still don't know like what is the original meaning of the 327, the number? Well, eight. the idea is sort of like James Bond is 007 and Therefore, he's like in the top rank, mm -hmm. and then it's like Agent ah. 327 is like I see the, he's at the bottom of the barrel. Gotcha. He's the last agent you would want to send out on a mission. <laughs> uh, makes sense. Here's my first question. So you said uh, you were 22 years old when you directed the first Blender official short Sintel, and how did you? Uh, first get into using Blender and what attracted you to it compared to the other 3D softwares uh, such as Maya and 3D Max at the time? Um, I feel very lucky to have stumbled into Blender um, and to have decided to stick with it because it's, you know, in 2003, it was a very, or four or five, it was a very different uh, tool. And now it's, it's one of uh, the most popular 3D tools out there. At the time, it was very small. And I was exploring uh, different options. I was interested in live action film and had found uh, this forum online for Star Wars fans who wanted to make movies of their own in their backyard in that universe. So mm. people were doing lightsaber battles and I really wanted to add like a spaceship, you know, flying in, in, in my backyard. Mm -hmm. The forum was on theforce.net and then there was a, a Blender specific, I think it was Blender Wars, that's what mm -hmm. it was, a website that had some pre-made models um, of like a TIE fighter and an X-wing. Mm -hmm. And so just downloading those files and starting to figure out how to use this tool was maybe the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, uh, Maya was the goal. I wanted to find out, figure out how to get a hold of and use 
yeah. Maya, but I had a Mac and I had no money because I was 15 and um, I couldn't figure out how to crack it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mac has uh, like a way stronger yeah, security system. So, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I, you know, if I had a Windows machine, probably I would have <laughs> learned on pir pirated software and I would have probably figured out how to get a hold of Maya. But mm -hmm. I'm really glad that I didn't. And of course, Blender is free and it's open source. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time, but there was already a community online mm -hmm. of other artists sort of helping each other figure stuff out. There wasn't tutorials online, just the bare minimum of text tutorials. Mm -hmm. There was a manual for Blender 2.3, which I ultimately got. It was you know, text, but I just did so much clicking and poking around and sort of learned it in the hardest way possible. I downloaded it and then deleted it multiple times before mm -hmm. I was like, got the hang of some, some of it. It was like such a steep learning curve. Yeah. yeah. Um, but initially it was, it was to support my live action filmmaking with some visual effects with some CG. Yeah. Mac considers like uh, one of the worst system to run the, the 3d softwares. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, like I can, but yeah, at the time was, yeah. It was important to the lead developer, Ton Rosendahl. Mm -hmm. If he decided it wasn't, you know, a priority, it, it wouldn't have happened. You know, as a open source project, it, it was important to him to, to make it available for all platforms. So mm -hmm. Linux, Windows, Mac. Can you share how your journey started from the experimenting with the Blender to the directing with their project? like official shirts or consulting roles, those kind of things. I feel very lucky about the timing uh, when I got into this stuff mm -hmm. um, because it was a small community. I was pretty involved online, you know, in um, forum, which is now Blender Artists, mm -hmm. was Elysian at the time. And I was just posting my work, um, work in progress, little renders, modeling things, getting creative feedback and notes and trying to improve mm -hmm. just as a 3d artist i would post my videos my, my my little short films the blender animation studio has this tradition of open movie projects they their very first um, film was called elephant stream and it was something that i was following online when it was getting made they were posting updates on their blog and i ordered a dvd you know, mm -hmm. a pre-order to DVD before it was done. And it was a big deal when that came out. And it was a whole, it's a whole short film made in Blender. Mm -hmm. And the, the caliber of the execution was quite good. It was so inspiring. And it was a team of maybe four or five or maybe six people who made the whole short um, at the studio out there. Um, and so when they were putting together their second team for their second project, which was called Big Buck Bunny, Project Peach, I remember it was called. I applied as an artist. Mm -hmm. I submitted a portfolio. It was, you know, not good <laughs> by any standard, but um, short film was part of it. It, it was animation, it was renders. Uh, I feel like I was developing my portfolio as a, as a 3D generalist, but also a storyteller. And I ended up on the wait list for that project. Basically, if they were going to get a certain amount, if they were gonna raise a certain amount more in terms mm -hmm. of the financing of the project, mm -hmm. they would have brought me on. Mm -hmm. um, there were two of us on the, on the wait list. So that was very exciting. And shortly after that, I met the, the team. Mm -hmm. uh, they were coming through Boston for SIGGRAPH. Okay. I think this was 2006. And I was in high school um, and they were looking for volunteers at the Blender booth. Mm. So I convinced my parents to let me take a train mm -hmm. to go to SIGGRAPH mm -hmm. and meet some strangers and volunteer at the booth. And while I was there, I showed Ton, the lead developer of Blender and the producer of these projects, mm -hmm. the one who had emailed me about the wait list. Mm -hmm. I showed him my... Um, my high school short, and mm -hmm. he invited me to present at mm -hmm. SIGGRAPH, you know, just at the booth, some mm -hmm. of uh, 
my work, you know, my 3D work. And basically there was a, a little creature that I created. And um, that was a really, really cool experience. And a couple of years passed after that, but I got an email when I was then in college pursuing filmmaking and animation full time uh, that uh, invited me to to direct the third, the next one, which was still to this day the luckiest, the craziest. Uh, it really made no sense. This opportunity just fell in my lap. I mean, I had been working towards it a little bit or developing some relationships, but I was not really vetted and I was so young that mm -hmm. it didn't really make sense. Tan cared a lot about these directors coming from the Blender community mm -hmm. rather than finding someone who is a very competent director mm -hmm. to learn a new software and come in. Mm -hmm. He wanted to really support uh, those who are really into the tool and I loved Blender and I continued to post my work online. So that's how that happened. Quite a journey. So does Blender have a dedicated team, like a film production step or are people brought together for each product and then dismissed afterward? How, how does the system work? You know, it took a while before they even had an office. By the time I joined for the third project, they were in an office, but most of the time that office was empty. It was only for a given project that they would raise enough money to support artists coming in. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were raising the money by pre-selling DVDs. So before they even start working on it, they were like, hey, Blender community, buy the DVD. Uh, It'll get made and then we'll ship it to you at yeah. the end. They also, though, got uh, financing from the Dutch Film Fund. Uh -huh. uh, so basically the Dutch government supports yeah. artistic mm -hmm. projects. And so between those two things, they had enough to uh, bring artists in. But the goal at the time was to build a studio, you know, and mm -hmm. now they have that. Now they're now, and I'm not sure exactly at what point this transition happened, mm -hmm. but now they have full-time artists who are always working on something. Blender Studio have a plan to make a sequel of uh, Agent three to seven or expand to a, a longer format like a feature or a series? Yeah, so at the time that was definitely part of the part of the point. That was the first project, or maybe it's the second, because uh, Cosmos Laundromat was also intended mm. to be sort of the first episode of something larger. Mm. Uh, and Agent 327 also was intended as a proof of concept. And actually while I was over there, I was working I, w I was writing on the feature version mm -hmm. of the uh, of that project, um, so that was definitely the dream, mm -hmm. and I think Tan in particular. Let me directly ask about a question everyone would like to hear. So people have a thought the Blender is in suit for big project, mm. but uh, Flow recently won the Golden Globe, which is a big one, beating the Inside Out Two and uh, the Wild Robot. Do you think Incredible. like a this? Yeah, this will change how Blender is perceived in the industry? I think so. I think there's been, over the last four years, a lot of, a lot of similar victories for Blender. A lot of sort of turning heads. And even in COVID, both Unreal and Blender <laughs> kind of exploded because a lot of people were stuck at home and were looking to expand as people, as artists and um to create and it's it's become so much more user friendly mm -hmm. and approachable and uh, and powerful and instant gratification you can now um, be looking at beautiful images without a whole lot of work or waiting you know flow is so impressive so gorgeous and incredible feat of storytelling and of animation mm -hmm. i love that film and i'm so inspired by it it was still a very small production, yeah. Yeah. very small, and something that the Blender Animation Studio is like at a similar right. scope, you yeah. know? So I think almost more than the tool itself, 
what I find the most striking about that is how maybe you don't need 200 people, right? You know, to make something mm -hmm. of that caliber. And mm -hmm. the whole thing was rendered in Eevee, which is the Blender's internal real time engine. Mm -hmm. So the entire feature film was rendered on one PC. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it looks incredible. Yeah, nobody could you know, imagine like that could happen. Like a, the Golden Globe winning <laughs> feature yeah. is rendered uh, by just one PC. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. And now it's uh, nominated for an Oscar. So I really hope that more filmmakers and small studios mm -hmm. um, and artists can see that and see mm -hmm. what's possible mm -hmm. and, um, and start making their, their version of flow. I mean, like the same thing is happening in game industry too. Uh, for example, like uh, the, the motion matching, which is a very complex animation system, expecting the gamer's next control direction and it automatically blend into that motion smoothly, which it, which is the developed by the Naughty Dog maybe like 10 years ago, but mm. that's very expensive system to use and then it's very complex to develop. So the other studio haven't used that technique, couldn't use that technique for a while but uh, from last update of the Unreal mm. the motion matching system is now built into Unreal so mm. we will start to see like uh, the last of a level of the animation from other studios uh, from now on or last I, I love kind of the threshold of where we are at mm -hmm. you know these days there's just so many more uh, tools to unlock you know mm -hmm. creativity and um, feels more and more like the limit is more me, what I think yeah, about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> creativity is the only limit, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which is a good place to be. Blender is a, an open source program, as you mentioned, and it seems like uh, the generative AI communities are embracing it to add more controllability over uh, AI-generated images these days. Do you think like uh, this could be another major factor driving the uh, expansion of Blender user numbers? Yeah, I think new years, users are coming from all sorts of places and communities. I remember even during the NFT bubble, mm. seeing a lot of, yeah, what's bubble? you know, more Blender yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, users as a result. It feels like a lot of cutting edge, edge or like experimentation is happening in Blender. And it has been cool to see tools written that plug into Stable Diffusion, for example. People can really do what they want with the tools. Colin이 남긴 마지막 말처럼 Unreal, Blender, 그리고 AI 툴들의 발전은 단순히 생산성 향상만을 의미하는 것은 아닌 것 같습니다. 오히려 소규모의 프로덕션 그리고 개인들은 기존의 200명, 300명이 있어야만 도전할 수 있었던 큰 규모의 임팩트 있는 작업물을 만들어갈 수 있는 그런 환경이 되었다는 것이고 그걸 또 다른 면으로 뒤집어서 본다고 한다면 큰 규모의 프로덕션이 아무래도 줄어들 수밖에 없기 때문에 잡 개수가 줄어든다는 그런 안 좋은 점을 볼 수도 있겠지만 제가 감히 예상하건대는 오히려 작은 규모의 임팩트 있는 스튜디오들의 개수가 상당히 늘어날 것이고 특정한 어디언스를 타겟팅한 니시 마켓들을 공략하는 그런 컨텐츠들이 앞으로 더 많이 나올 것 같습니다. 영화를 따지자면은 블록버스터보다는 그보다는 조금 작은 규모의 영화들이 더 많이 나올 것 같고 그리고 게임으로 따지자면은 트리플 A보다는 더블 A 사이즈에서 조금 더 상상력이 돋보이는 그런 게임들이 더 많이 나올 수 있는 그런 환경이 될것 같습니다. 물론 그렇다고 해서 큰 규모의 프로젝트가 아예 없어지는 그런 시장은 오진 않을 것 같고요. 이러한 변화들을 꾸준히 팔로우하는 것은 굉장히 중요하다고 생각을 합니다. 단 2, 30명이 만든 플로우라는 블렌더 애니메이션이 과연 인사이드 아웃 2 그리고 와일드 로봇, 픽사와 드림웍스라는 거대한 애니메이션 스튜디오를 이겨내고 아카데미에서도 좋은 성과를 낼지 한번 지켜볼 관전 포인트가 될것 같습니다. 그럼 오늘의 영상은 여기서 마치겠습니다. 스키먼 웨스트의 션킴이었습니다. 음.